book of Luke chapter 1. And in honor of God's word, I'm going to ask that we all stand. And we're going to read these verses. We'll start in verse 5. And it says this. It says, when Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah. And his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's, uh, in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a gr uh, great crowd stood outside, pr outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he, when he saw him. But the angel of the Lord said, don't be afraid. Zechariah, God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. And you will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. Verse 16. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord, their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this word. I pray right now that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, give us an ear to hear and a heart to receive. Father, not my words, but your words. Not my thoughts, but your thoughts. Lord, have your way in this place. Lord, let, it, let your word be deposited. Let it produce change, let transformation, encouragement. Whatever it is that you want to get to us and through us, Lord, do it. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And everybody says, amen. You may be seated. I, I cannot this morning overestimate right the importance of the life of John the Baptist when we we look at the Christmas story right that centers on Jesus as it should right we, we, we talk about how he was born in a manger and there's a star who led the wise men to Jesus and how the angel appeared to Mary and Joseph and all of these things all these different things very very important and relevant you know stories and, and principles that we can learn from that story but there's a prequel. There's something that happens before the birth of Christ, and it's, it's the birth of John the Baptist. And I can't overestimate how important this is. And one might say, well, it's not that important. He's not, the, he's not the Messiah. He's not the Son of God. Well, it's so important that God wanted it to be included in the Gospels. It's so important that God, that even before the angel appeared to Mary and Joseph, an angel appeared to Zechariah, and, and caused a supernatural uh, birth to happen in the body of Elizabeth as well. So it's so important. And if it's there, it's because there's something that he's wanting to get to us through this story. Amen. How many of you know that when every time you come to church, it's not just about receiving information. Listen, it, it, information is important. But, but listen, I want you to hear something today that sparks a revelation in your mind and in your soul. Because you can come to church, but if you don't receive anything and there's no revelation based on the information, can I tell you something? Then it's just a religious religious routine. And so I'm not into religious routine. I want to hear from God, and I want God to show me something that's going to change my life. Amen? That's going to change my marriage. It's going to change my family. It's going to change my community. And so today I'm asking God to reveal something based on the story that we've just read that will cause a transformation in your life. Because information with revelation will always produce transformation. Amen? So in this story, we, we see that, that, that John the Baptist is to be born. And, and the prophet, or the angel, excuse me, declares these things over the life of John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist had a prophetic role to play. In other words, there was meaning, there was significance to his birth. There was meaning and significance to his life. There was a divine or what I would call a heavenly mandate on his life. And his, his role is important because, because before Jesus could start his ministry, listen, before Jesus could start the healings and the miracles and the signs and the wonders, God had ordained, had mandated from heaven that John the Baptist must set the way or set the course. He was a forerunner. So before... Jesus could do his thing, John had to do his thing. Are you hearing me? See, I believe that we can learn from the life of John the Baptist because, 
before we can present Jesus to the world, we need to let God work through us. Amen. We are the forerunner just as John was the forerunner. So I want us to look at the heavenly mandate on John's life and what we can learn from this. There's four things I want to share with you today. Number one, what we learn about John and his mandate over his life is this. The, the, the angel said and declared over his life that he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. Now this is significant because if you understand the time in which John was born and, and, and in which his ministry began, you will understand that the Jewish people were in a, were in a time of, of, of great confusion. They were confused in so many different ways because in their life, in that, in that time period, the Jewish people were under Roman occupation. They had a Roman empire over them, governing them. And, and so then, so that you had the Caesar and the Roman Empire. And then they had a, a, a regional leader named Herod who, who the Romans appointed to watch over the Jewish people. And then they had the religious leaders, the Pharisees. And then they had some political leaders called the Sadducees. And they had all these different groups and all these different factions uh, trying to control the people and lead the people. And the people were all stuck in the middle. The, the religious environment was crazy. The political environment was crazy. And the people were confused. And it's in this moment that John enters the picture. And John, listen, John is called to turn the people's attention to God. See, the world was saying, look at the political leaders, look at the religious leaders, look at the governmental leaders, look at societal leaders. But John comes and says, listen, don't look at any of those things, look to God. See, and this is significant for us today because even today in our world, we face some of the same struggles that they faced back then. There's nothing, there's really nothing new under the sun, right? Right, the same things that they face, we face today. We're under political, we're in a climate of political distress right now. Social distress, religious distress, you name it, it's all around us. And so today, while people may be looking to those things for answers, we also know that people are looking to other things for fulfillment, but also to distract themselves from the realities of their life. See, they, they say, well, if I can have a greater job or a better job, or if I can have more money, or if I can have a greater career, or if I can have more things, or if I can have more friends, or if I can have the right husband or the right wife, if I can have the right this, and the, if I can drive the right car, live in the right neighborhood, if I can have all these things. See, all those things are trying to find fulfillment. If I can have those things, then I'll feel happy. You know, I'll never forget many years ago uh, watching a, uh, one of those documentary shows on the NFL Network on uh, – on a, a very famous uh, player, uh, primetime Deion Sanders, right? He was a great NFL cornerback, and, 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 and he, he had all the talent. He had all this talent and great ability to play football. And so he, was, he played on a team that, that at that time at the Atlanta Falcons, they had no chance of ever winning the Super Bowl, right? Great player, and, and he was empty, and he, was, he, he couldn't win a championship, so he got traded to San Francisco, and, and then he thought, okay, well, if I'll win a, a, a championship, then I'll feel fulfilled, and he, and he won a championship. And after winning this, the Super Bowl, he said he felt just as empty that he did before he won the championship. So he says, I guess I got I to gotta win another one. So then he went to one of the greatest teams ever. Come on, somebody. In my opinion. He went to the Dallas Cowboys and he won, he won the championship and they've never won again. Come on, amen. And, and he went and he won another one thinking that he was going to be fulfilled. And guess what happened? No fulfillment. He felt just as empty. Right? Just as empty. And that's what, where many people find themselves, right? They find themselves, look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have this. I'm going to acquire this. I'm going to have this relationship. I'm going to have this friendship. I'm going to have this promotion. I'm going to get this promotion. I'm going to get all these things. And when they get them, they still feel empty. They're not fulfilled. Then they become depressed. And so now they're not looking for fulfillment. Now they're looking to escape the negativity and all the bad things in their life, the low moments of life. And so now, not, now they, just, they just don't want to be fulfilled now they want to escape and so now they turn to things to escape the reality of their life they'll they'll escape and they'll well if I can be you know with this person if I can have these group of friends or or if I can you know if I can just take this and they medicate themselves through 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 alcohol and and, and illegal drugs and 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 prescription medication I mean it's it's all around us right 
It's all around us because, listen, what the enemy does is he wants to get the people's attention and say, listen, you're so broken, you need to look somewhere else. You need to look to this. And so what ends up happening is these things, listen, these things, relationship, wealth, career, possession, illegal narcotics, all these things, listen, they, they, they come to that point where they get their attention, watch, and their affection. The enemy's trying to get your attention and your affection. But listen, those things that are fighting for your attention and your affection, you want to know what they ultimately do? They ultimately seduce you and manipulate you. They control you. Come on. It's a heaviness. It's a burden on your life. And the thing, the thing that you thought you had under control, you have no control over, and it actually controls you. See? You're seduced. You see, and just as... Just as John, John enters the picture and he tells the people, he goes to his part of the wilderness. The Bible tells us that when he began his ministry, right, he went to the wilderness and all he would tell people was this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was saying, listen, you need to turn to God. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to turn to God. John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 says this about John the Baptist. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light, Jesus Christ, so that everyone might believe him because of his testimony. Listen to this. God has sent you to tell others about the light, Jesus Christ, so that they could turn to him and believe in him because of your testimony, because of what God has done in you, because, because of what God has done through you. They see it. Come on, are you hearing me today? See, just as John was called to, to turn people to Jesus, we are called to tell people, turn to the Father. Number two, he was a man, talking about John the Baptist, he will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, if you don't know anything about, about Elijah, let me just remind you or let me give you some information about Elijah. Elijah was an Old Testament prophet that was a clear and powerful moral voice to God's people. Elijah was a prophet that God used, listen, to speak to three groups of people. He spoke to the people who were rebellious, Number two, he spoke to the, to the false prophets that were leading God's people into, into worshiping idols. And number three, listen, he spoke to the king and queen of the day. And he admonished them and he called them out. And because of this, Elijah was not very well liked. In fact, on many occasions, they went out after him to kill him. But just as Elijah, listen to this, just as Elijah spoke to the people, to the false prophets... And to the nobility of that day, listen to what I'm about to say. John the Baptist did the same thing. John the Baptist spoke to three groups of people. He spoke to the people in the wilderness telling them, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he spoke, listen to the religious leaders. If you see it, I, think, I believe it's in John chapter, uh, John chapter 2 or 3. He calls out the religious Pharisees of the day and he calls them snakes. I mean, how would you like to be called a snake? So well, it depends. What kind of snake? A snake is a snake. He cuts a little deeper and he says, you're a sna- you guys are you're, you're a brood of vipers. You're a brood of snakes. But he also called out Herod, the leader of the, gov- of the, of the region, for, for, his, for his bad behavior, his immoral behavior. And he would call him out. So just as Elijah did that, John the Baptist did that. Why did he do that? Because the, the, the angel said he will have the spirit... And the power of Elijah. In other words, he's going to minister. He's going to prophesy with that same perspective, with that same attitude, with that same drive. And so that's exactly what he did. He was a clear voice. He said, this is right. This is wrong. This is acceptable. This is not acceptable. This is righteousness. This is uh, uh, unrighteousness. This is sinful. Come on. He, he, there was no wavering in his communication of the word of God. Are you hearing me today? He would only declare what God told him to declare. Now, here's what I, what I, what I love about John the Baptist is that John the Baptist embraced, right, being a prophet or a messenger from God. Listen. He embraced, he embraced being a, a prophet, right? He became a powerful voice for the coming Messiah. But just as John became a clear and moral voice for God, listen, you and I have been called to be a clear and moral voice for God as well. God has called each and every one of us. Now, there are, there are two types of Christians. There are those who believe that God plays 
an, a passive role in our life. That God is just sitting up in heaven and he just lets things play out. And when you have that kind of perspective on God, then guess what? You adopt that same perspective about your faith. Your faith becomes very passive. Like, it doesn't really matter what I do. What's going to happen is going to happen. So I don't really need to serve. I don't need to witness. I don't need to be a voice. Because God is passive. I am passive. But then there's another group of people. The other type of Christian is that you believe that God plays an active role. That he actually cares about your life. That he cares about your family. That he cares about your marriage. That he cares about your finances. That he cares about your well-being. That he can heal you. That he can set you free. Amen. That he can break the strongholds that are on your life. That, see, that's an active role. And when you believe that God is active in the affairs of human, uh, 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 human beings, come on, then your faith has to be active. Because if God is active, I must be active. Right? And so if God is active and he chooses to use uh, John as a, as a messenger, as a voice, listen, that means that he's chosen us to be a voice too. Right? He's chosen us to be a voice. Brother Zach, come and join me up here one more time. He did this in the first service. He's going to do it again. But I want you to, there, there are different ways that we respond to the call of God uh, to be a voice. God is calling us to be a voice. And there are different ways that we respond. And let's just, I'm just going to take this, this uh, folded sheet of paper as it, it represents the message from heaven, right, that God wants to give us to give to the people. Now, the, the, let's just say that Zach here represents the Holy Spirit, right? And, and here's the first response that, that, that many of us, right, uh, respond or give to God when, when he's trying to use us to be a messenger, right, or to be a voice. And, and so, so Zach's going to try to deliver the message. Go ahead, Zach. The first response is that we're oblivious to the message. We don't even recognize that God is trying to use us to be a voice, Right? We're, in a, we're oblivious, like, I don't, need, I don't even see the message. I don't even see that it's there. What message? God wants to use you. Me? I've never heard God say anything to me. How could God use me? So we're oblivious to the message. So, so the first response is that we, we don't even know that God wants to use us. Here's the second one. Go ahead, try one more time. Here, here's the second response. The second response is, we try to ignore the message. No, no, no. Give it to somebody else. Not me. Give it to the pastor. Don't give it to me. Give it to Corey. Give it to sister so-and-so. Give it to the prayer warriors. Give it to the life. Not me. So we, we, we reject it by ignoring it. We know that it's there. See, many of us in this room, God has been trying to get you, right, to give a message to a family or a, fa or, or, or a friend, right, a family member or a friend. He's been trying to use you to be a light, but you've been fighting it. You've been saying, not me. And what you're doing is, is you're delaying somebody else's breakthrough. Somebody needs a breakthrough in your family, and you're delaying it because of your disobedience. Come on, somebody. So here's the third one. Here's the third response. The Holy Spirit is going to give us a message. Here it is. <sighs> now you're a reluctant messenger with an attitude. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Zach. Ross, and so what ends up happening is, how many of you know that when you take that atti attitude, come on, you become ineffective? You, you're limited in what you can say because, can I tell you something? What happens is we become a reluctant added, uh, messenger with an attitude, and, and we, what, what happens is we're, we're fighting God. And then we get the message, watch, and we know what the message is like, okay, all right, here we go. All right. And let's just say that I have to come over here to Brother Junior, and God gives me the message, and I go here, watch, Junior, here's the message. What I say? Okay, what I say, watch, what happens is, is that when we don't find our voice, our voice becomes muffled and, and, and muddled and no one can make out what we're trying to say. Why? Because we're reluctant. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. Well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. What if they reject what I say? What if they want to be my friend anymore? What if I don't get invited to those gatherings? What if they think I'm weird? What if they call me a holy roller? 
What do they think that I did? Oh, you, you found religion. What do they, well, I mean, the list goes on and on. All the while, that person still needs the word from God. You don't know, but maybe, maybe Junior or someone like Junior, right, has been praying for a word from God. God, if you're real, God, if you're out there, send somebody. Maybe you, they've been waiting on you, but because you've been fighting it off and resisting and you've been, you've been trying to give it to somebody else, guess what? You're delaying his breakthrough, their breakthrough. But John wasn't like that. John said, listen, I'm going to be a clear voice. I'm going to tell people, you need to turn to God. You need to repent. I'm going to tell the religious leaders, I know what's in your heart, and it's evil. You're a brood of vipers. I'm going to tell Herod, you're immoral. You've done bad things. You've been a bad example to your people. He was very clear and consistent. When our voice, listen, when our voice and the words that come out of our mouth don't reflect our faith, our convictions, and our beliefs, listen, listen, what happens is, is we confuse people. That's why sometimes people look at Christians and they're like, what? They, I saw them on Facebook and they were like, hallelujah, Jesus. But then over here, they're doing this. <laughs> Come on. So I saw, I saw a meme the other day. I thought it was funny. It was a while back. It says, I've seen your Instagram feed. I know what I'm getting you for Christmas. Clothes and a Bible. Come on, somebody. Somebody say amen, someone say ouch. I don't know. But when our voice doesn't match up to the convictions and the beliefs and our faith, what happens is people look at us and they're confused, and then they, bec they begin to question the authenticity of our faith. Like, is that real? Or is that just real fake? So we, we stay in the faith because of, because of us. And, and, and I'm telling you, the, the world doesn't need more confusion. It needs the church to be clear. I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying you got to go to, you know, stand in a corner in the you know, intersection. Where you're all going to hell. I see you all burning in hell. I'm not saying what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, man, in your situation, in your break room, in your school campus, in your house, in your community, in, with your friends, with your family, at the restaurant, you can just say, hey, man, God loves you. I, uh, I was very moved yesterday at my life group. My son, Jared, was with me at, the, at my life group. And Jared has his own life group that he does on, on he goes to on, um, on Mondays. But he likes to come into my life group because there's always food at mine. <laughs> and I, he, he comes to me with prayer, and then we go to life group, and then he's like, and he heard there was going to be tamales, you know. And we were going to our life group, and he's like, he's like, are you ready for life group? And, and he goes, I'm ready for tamales. But in our life group, after he had tamales, right, uh, he hadn't told me this story. It's something that happened to him this week. He was in class, or I think he was, I think you were walking to the college. Is that right? Or uh, where was that, son, in class? He was just, you were, you were talking to a peer, one of his peers at school. And one of the peers confided in him and opened up to them and just basically shared my life has no meaning I'm, I'm paraphrasing here and he begins and the, the, the schoolmate begins to say you know I'm contemplating suicide and how many of that's pretty heavy for a, six, a 15 year old so Jared he says I have been confronted with this what do I you, you can't you, you don't have time to call the pastor you can't call up life group leader. He's, he's the one at that moment. So he begins to tell that individual, look, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And everything changed. See, I'm telling you, I'm telling you at that moment, that person needed a voice. And Jared was not the voice. He was just the mouthpiece through which the voice went through. See? <laughs> And that individual did not commit suicide. That individual thanked Jared because that person hadn't heard something like that. That person didn't know that, hey, I didn't ever stop to think that God would have a purpose for my life. See, you don't know who's around you. You don't know what, who, who, who needs the word from God from, that God wants to get through you. 
See, the third thing that we see from, from, uh, from the life of, of John is that it says that he will prepare, number three, he will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Um, if, if you've ever been to a concert, a comedy concert or a music concert, you know that before the main you know, act goes out, there's always an opening act, right? How many of you know that? Right? Some of you are like, I'm not, I've never been to a concert. You lie like a word. <laughs> Don't act all holy. I went to see Chris Tomlin. And then, oh, come on. <laughs> Whatever. Right? You go on to concerts. Before the concert, right, the main act goes out, right, there's always an opening act, right? And now, how many of you know that the opening act in a concert is there not to allow time for the main band to warm up? That's not why the opening act is there. The opening act is there to warm the people up for what's about to come. And so this is what John was called to do. John was called to set the stage, right, for the people to be ready to receive the Messiah. And so, you know, one of the interesting things I find about John is if you read and study the life of John the Baptist, you will discover that John... Through the life of John, it's not recorded at least, that no miracle ever happened through John. He never healed anybody. There was never something supernatural that happened per se. Like he didn't open up the rivers, right? He didn't call fire from heaven. There was no, he didn't say rain and it rained. He didn't multiply food and no, no, uh, no miracle. Because he understood that his job, watch, was just to get people ready for the Messiah. Now, so then what was it that he did that got the people ready? What was it that sparked or, or created that hunger in people? You want to know what it was? It wasn't his, necessarily his great preaching. It wasn't, you know, that he had, you know, a great church that he preached from. No. You want to know what it was? Is that he was just faithful. That's all. He didn't have a platform like this. He didn't have a facility like this. He just would go out to the desert. Out to the wilderness, the Bible says. And the people would go to him. And all he would do was tell them, turn to God, turn to God, turn to God. Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's all he would do. Are you hearing me today? Listen, God is not looking for the most talented. He's not looking for the ones who've got the greatest. He's, well, God can't use me. I don't have the ability. I can't play an instrument. I don't know how to do I can't teach. God is not looking for your ability. Come on. He's wanting to see, can you be faithful? Can you be faithful to just show up? Come on. Can you be faithful to worship? Can you be faithful to praise? Can you be faithful to give? Can you be faithful to go to a life group? Can you be faithful to serve in the nursery? Can you be faithful in youth ministry? Can you be faithful in prayer? Can you be faithful at your job? Can you just be faithful? Listen, you be faithful and then I'll show up and do what you can't do. But I just need you to be faithful. See? Some people, well, I need to have all this ability and I need to be able to speak. And I, No, you just need to be faithful. Faithful. Listen, God can do... You know what I've, I've, I've learned in the, in the years of my ministry is that God can do more with faithful people than he can with talented people. Because I've always wondered, I said, God, I, I'm going to be honest. Can I be transparent for just a moment? I said, Lord, why don't I, why, why, you know how much I love to worship you? You know how much I love to play the guitar? You know how much I love to do that? And I love, and I've been leading, doing worship since I was like 10 years old in my father's church. And I said, Lord, why don't you give me the voice of Michael Buble? Why, Lord? Why can't you give me a great voice? Why don't you make me a nice, a great guitar player like Eric Clapton, Lord? Why can't I play like that? I wish I could sing like them. And I sing better. And I said, I said, Lord, anoint my voice or anoint people's ears so they hear my voice better. <laughs> and you know what I've discovered? Not that God can't use talented people. Because he sure does. we got some amazing, talented people here at church. John does an amazing job. Our ladies, everybody does an amazing job. But I'm like, God, what about, what about my talent? And the guy's like, listen, listen, if I gave you a better talent, then you'd get the glory. But, but I get the glory. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> fine. I'll just keep on loving to worship you, Lord. You know what? I, you know what? I may not have the best voice, but I love to worship the Lord. And I can do what Michael Bublé can't do. 
and I can't do, I can do what all these other music, I can lead people into the presence of God, amen? I can. You know what? It's just faithful. Just being faithful. Just show up. Just show up. Oh, I can't preach like Pastor George. Just show up. Just be faithful. See? See, we, we must remain faithful in our calling, and at the right time, people will, will encounter Jesus. Galatians chapter 6, verse, 19 says, verse 9 says this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good, for at just the right time, everybody say right time. At just the right time, at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Sometimes the one who gets blessed is the one who didn't give up. Just don't give up. But I'm tired. Don't give up. But I'm weary. Don't give up. You got to be like that mom who doesn't give up on their son or their daughter. Everybody's giving up on them, but you're not giving up on them. God's not giving up on you either. Amen. Don't give up. Listen, John understood that he, his faithfulness, listen, in his faithfulness, he understood that he was just a warm-up act. You know, there was, there, was a, there was an occasion in John chapter 3 where after John the Baptist baptized Jesus, now, watch, all John did was preach, right, and baptize people. That's what he did. But now Jesus is preaching, and people are getting healed, and he's performing miracles, and all these great things are happening. So what do you think happened to the crowds? They went from John the Baptist, and they started going to Jesus. And they're like, well, John the Baptist, he's a great preacher. He's a, he's a great communicator. But this guy over here, I mean, he, people are getting healed. The demons are coming out of people. I mean, he's, he's turned water into wine. Hello, somebody. He, he's done all these things. And so people, people are, the, the crowd starts shifting to Jesus. And so the, John the Baptist had disciples, and they come to him at the end of John chapter 3, and, and they say, hey, John, do you know that guy that you, the Messiah that you baptized? You baptized him, right? He didn't baptize you. You baptized him. Yeah, yeah. He goes, you don't know what's happening. He says, our numbers are getting less. Our numbers aren't the same. They left, our, they left our group to go to his group. They left our church to go to his church. Come on, somebody. Huh? Our numbers are dwindling. They're getting lower. What do you think about that? He's taking our people. You know what John said? I love his, his response in John chapter uh, 3, verse 29. And this really, this hit me like a ton of bricks, right? He said this. He says, I am filled with with joy at his success. I'm not bitter. I'm not angry that people are following him. I'm happy. And then in verse 30 he says, he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. What an attitude. See? That, that, that someone would say, it's not about me. It's about him. It's not about my church and, and my little area of the, of, the, of the valley of the sun. It's not about me over here. It's about the king. It's about him. It's not about the number of services that we have and the amount of people that we have. It's about the king, amen? If I'll just be faithful with what he's put in my hand, God will take care of the rest, amen? I'll, I'll preach and I'll encourage and I'll exhort, but I'm just going to be faithful with God because it's not about George Molina. It's not about Lifeway Church. It's not about our life groups. It's not about our school. It is about the king, and it will always be about the king. I've got to be less so that he can become greater. And as long as he's greater, can I tell you something? If I allow him to be greater in me and in this place, come on, God is glorified. See? That's what I want. That's what I want. I'm going to ask Faith to come on up if you can, sweetheart. Number four, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. This, this is a verse that many years ago uh, I would just pass over. I, I, it didn't make much sense to me, if, I, if I'm honest with you guys. It didn't, it didn't make much sense, like the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons of the, to the you know, their hearts back to the fathers. I, I, didn't, I really didn't understand it until I became a father. And it's one of those things that that God in his infinite wisdom, he, he does something supernaturally in families. I want you to look what it says here on the screen on Malachi chapter 4 verse 6. Now, this is interesting because this is the, the last, this is the last verse of the Old Testament. 
The last verse of the Old Testament is this. It says, talking about Elijah, his preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, what? Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. So it's, this is the last verse of the Old Testament. Now skip to Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. He says about John the Baptist, he says this, and he will prepare uh, for, the, for the coming of the Lord, people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the God. And he's talking about he will turn the hearts of the kids back to the fathers. So watch, there's the bridge. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, the last verse, he says, I'm going to turn the hearts of the father to the kids and the kids back to the father. And then in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, he says the exact same thing. There's a connection. The Old Testament and the New Testament are connected. I, I used this statement earlier. How many of you know that there's nothing new under the sun? That's what the book of Ecclesiastes says. He says, listen, ev everything that has been is and will be. In other words, there is no, there's really no situation that you have faced that others haven't faced before. How many of you know that the first family in the Bible had conflict? Do you know what the first issue in family was? It was between Adam and Eve. You know what the issue was? When Adam sinned and Eve sinned and God confronted Adam and he says, what did you do? Watch this. Adam being the godly man that he was said, it's the wife you gave me. Ladies, how would you like to be thrown under the bus by your husband? That's exactly what happened. It wasn't me, it was her. You gave her to me, it's her. So watch, then they have two sons, and so now they're offspring. Guess what? They have, one gets jealous, gets angry, and he kills the brother. There's nothing new under the sun. Watch, you, you go to John chapter 2. Watch this. The first issue between between uh, first conflict between people was a husband and a wife the second issue is their offspring watch the first miracle that Jesus did in John chapter 2 was at a wedding had to do with a husband and wife and that was turning water into wine the second miracle he does watch this is someone's son who's dying so he addresses the marriage and he addresses the offspring watch you know what I've discovered in all my years of ministry I've discovered that for the most part now there's always exceptions to the rule but for the most part, kids, children, they're ready to forgive for the most part. Like you just, somebody hurts a kid, like tell them you're sorry. Sorry. Okay, they go back to the playground and play. But it's, the problem is, is when they get older. You want to know why? Because bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness is a learned behavior. Have you ever noticed that things were a lot simpler when your kids were kids? Right? Why? Because they were teachable. But when they get older, right, it's harder because guess what? They, they get their own ways and they have their own way of thinking and they get stubborn. And guess what? It's in that area. Now, listen, it's not just the kids. It's both of them. It's everybody. And so what happens is, is that here, God says about John through the angel, he says, listen, this, his preaching is going to cause the hearts of the father to be restored to the hearts of the kids and the hearts of the kids back to the father. And then he says, if this doesn't happen, he says in Malachi 4, 6, he says, I will come to, down to the land and the land will be cursed. Can I tell you something? When, listen, when you, when you prevent God from healing your home, your home is under a curse. Because the father and the kids and the mother and the kids are at odds. God cannot bless that. Come on. You want to know, same thing happened in the first service. Everything was great, but now when I touch, when I touch on family issues, all of a sudden a nerve was touched. Everybody starts shutting down. That's what I'm talking about. That's, what, that's the issue. That's what God wants to deal with this morning. He wants to deal with the issue that's in your family that nobody wants to address and talk about. That you have swept under the rug, that you've ignored, that you've blamed somebody else. Come on. You've made it their problem when it's really your problem as well. But they did. No, no, no. I'm not asking you what they did. I'm asking you what is God calling you to do? 
See, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. What is, what was, is, and will be. But can I tell you something? The same God who healed them can heal us. I've also learned this, that there is nothing impossible for God. There's nothing impossible for God. And maybe in your life you've, you've been trying and you've been, I'm doing my part. Will you keep on doing your part? Well, how long do I have to wait? As long as it takes. You keep on doing what God's told you to do. And if you're obedient, guess what? You're going to see the miracle of God. Because some of you know that restoration between children and fathers and, and sons and daughters and vice versa, it's going to take some time. See, back in 2009, Many, many people, you know, nobody, hardly anybody knows this, but my family, I, my family, I'm talking about my family back in Texas with my siblings. There's about, there was uh, nine of us, and now there's eight of us. Uh, we went through, we went through really bad, something really bad in our, in our family. And nobody knows about it other than us, and, you know. And it, it devastated me. It devastated everyone in our family. And I felt powerless because I'm over here in Arizona and everything was happening back there. And, and I'm getting phone calls and I'm getting all this stuff. And people are really upset. It got so upset. It got so bad. It got so bad that, that um, you know, my family stopped basically getting together. If I wanted to be with some parts of my family, you know, I had to go at their house. But we were never together, ever, ever, all together. And so, that's why many times when I talk about family, I, I choke up. Because I see some of you guys sit down with your family, and I see, and, I, and, I, and I'm happy for you, I really am. But I, down deep, I'm envious of you too. Because I can't do that, or I couldn't do that. And for years, that, that weighed on my heart. And that's why whenever I bring up my family, and my brothers, and my sisters, and my, my heart, cried because it hurt it hurts and I said God you got to do something God you got to do something God you got to and it got so bad that that and I and I'm very close to my father I love my father he's not a perfect man but I love my dad he is I am here today because of my father because I have a mom and a dad that prayed for me and that loved me but it got so bad it got so bad that my oldest brother who I love he was just here Several months ago, I think in May, he was here. Me and him are like this. But my brother came to me and basically said, listen, I don't want you to ever bring up that man to me again. He's no longer my father. I don't want to, don't talk to me about him. So anytime I wanted to bring up my dad, I couldn't talk to my brother. I love these two men, my father and my brother. And he never, never wanted to hear about him. So I'd go visit him, I'd visit my dad separately, but never together. And about, I don't know, about nine months ago, you know, my brother, who hadn't been walking with God, he had fallen away from the Lord, all of a sudden God started doing something in his life. And I knew that something was about to change. I knew that God was about to do something. And then all of a sudden, one day when I'm talking to him, it was, it was this was about in, in April or May of this year, we talked. And then he asked me a question. He says, so how's dad? I had not heard my brother say dad in over 10 years. He hadn't used the term dad. He would always call him that man or our mom's husband. He was so angry. And he said, dad. And I tell you what, man, my heart wanted to melt. You know, like, <laughs> what just happened? He said, Dad. And then things started, he started, you could tell that things were starting to melt. And as, as he got right with his heavenly father, he started getting right with his earthly father. And don't, don't get me wrong, he had every right to be upset with my dad, right? And I just, he was angry, he was upset, and the, the family was, was bitterly divided. So in July, when we went this past summer to visit, my oldest sister who was who was upset as well and you know we could see that God was changing some things in our family and then God's and then she said to me hey can you come for Thanksgiving 
And I was like, well, you know, it's a long drive. It's just, it's, we have to be back for Monday. She goes, no, you need to come. And, 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 and my sister, man, God's doing a work in my sister's life too. And, and she was different. And so we made the say, okay, well, sure, we'll, we'll see what we can do. And we made a, we, we talked about it and said, okay, we're going to go. We're going to go for, for Thanksgiving. We hadn't been with our family in 20 years, Thanksgiving over there. And uh, the week before we were going to leave, I called my brother up. My father's in a, like a nursing home facility because he's doing physical rehab on some, on some stuff. And, and so he's not, he's not at home right now. So I called my brother and I said, hey, Rudy, I said, I'm going to go visit dad while I'm down there. And he goes, and I said, I want you to go with me. And I waited. And he said, okay, let's do it. So we made our way down to the Austin area on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday morning, we took a drive to go see my dad. They hadn't seen each other or talk, really talked to each other in almost 10 years. And I just told my brother, I said, listen, dad's, dad's older. He's 82 now. He's older. So just preparing yourself, okay? Prepare yourself for what you're about to see. And I walked into the room with my brother. And my brother walked in. I saw my dad. My dad was sitting on his bed. They embraced. And they wept. And I was standing, I was standing, you know, by the bed, and I was watching, and they were crying. My dad was crying, and he was crying. I wasn't crying. I was standing there just like this. And my brother's crying, he turns around and he goes, he says to me, Why aren't you crying? And I'm just taking it all in. Just taking it all in. And then they began to talk, and you could tell they were nervous. And then I just stepped in. I said, Dad, I said, you haven't seen your son in 10 years. You haven't really talked. What do you have to tell him? What do you have to say? And he said, son, I'm sorry. My brother began to cry again. And I says, Rudy, what do you have to tell your dad? And they again began to cry. The next day on Thanksgiving, we were, the whole family, all the siblings, we hadn't been together, I don't know how long, all of us. And we were sitting around, my mom has this little apartment. I'm serious, it's probably, I don't know, a thousand square feet. It's small, right? And my mom determined that for Thanksgiving, she was going to get all 27 of us in her apartment. I was like, mom, seriously, don't, we'll make it work. I don't know how she did it, but she did it. I mean, there was no empty space in that apartment. There was tables set up everywhere. And everybody was sitting in this one makeshift long table. And everybody was like this. And my brother, you know, he prays for the food. And, and I'm looking at all, and, and everybody's crying, you know, because we haven't been together. Because we've been, we've been upset. Or they've been upset. There's been division and all this stuff. And my brother's crying. And my mom's crying. My siblings are crying. And I'm not crying. I'm just standing there, smiling, taking it all in. And my brother looks over at me and goes, why aren't you crying? I'm like, I'll cry later. And all I could think about is, is when I was, when I was thinking about that moment, I was thinking to myself, I was, I was witness to a miracle, to a, to a brother who said he'd never, ever talk to my father again. I saw him not only talk to him, but hug him and kiss him. And a father who embraced him and kissed him as well. Our siblings who had never sat together or hadn't sat together. I, was, I felt like I was living a miracle. But this is what God has called us to do. See, I believe that the pain that you've gone through in your family and your siblings and parents or whatever the issue is, that God wants you to be a healer. He wants to use you to bring healing to that situation. I don't know what God's asking you to do today. I don't know... You know, maybe there's an issue between a sibling or a parent. I don't know what God's asking you to do. But here's what I would tell you to do is that whatever it is God's asking you to do, do it. 
you need to pick up the phone, pick up the phone. If you need to write a letter, write a letter. If you need to go knock on a door, go knock on a door. But what if they don't respond? You do your part and keep on believing. Because I've prayed for 10 years and I kept on praying and I kept on weeping and I kept on breaking down. And I said, Lord, you got to do something. God, you got to touch my family. Here I am, a man of God here at, at, at Buckeye, and my family over there is over there all messed up and hurting. And I, God, you got to do something. I pray for other families. God, I pray for my family. I'm going to ask everyone to stand right there where you're at for just a moment. I want to declare these things over us. There's powerful declarations. I want to declare these four things over our lives, that we're going to be people that turn people's hearts to God, that we're going to be a clear and consistent voice for God that we're going to set the stage for people to encounter Christ, that we're going to facilitate healing in broken families and relationships. Right there with your eyes closed, I'm going to ask everybody in this room, if you can, just lift your hands to God if you can as you receive this word, this declaration over your life, over your family, over your marriage. Lord, I declare that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I declare that we are a people, that we are a church, a body of believers that will turn people's hearts to God. I declare that in this place that we are a people that will be a clear and consistent voice for God in this community, in our campuses, in our jobs, and wherever we go. I declare over this place, Lord, that we will set the stage for people to encounter Christ on a regular basis, Lord. The lost will be found. People will come to faith in Jesus Christ, Lord, here in Lifeway Church. And I declare finally, Lord, that in this place that we will facilitate healing in broken families, in broken marriages, and in broken relationships. Lord, I come against the schemes of the enemy that has tried to divide and conquer families. Lord, that's tried to destroy families. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare peace. I declare unity, Father, like never before. I declare, God, that there will be a miracle, God, that, Father, that phone calls will be made, that letters will be sent, that emails will be sent, that texts will be sent, that, that Father, that you will facilitate a reunion. I declare family reunions in Jesus' name, Lord. And, Father, I pray right now that you would bring healing to those who've been offended, those who've been hurt. Lord, I pray that uh, against unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment, Lord, I pray against anger. I pray against anything that would prevent unity from happening, God, in the name of Jesus Christ.